So um, who'd like to tell us at least their understanding of what smart contracts are? Um, so let's go around, um, share um, the different understandings and the different views um, that people have uh, until now. Uh, so anyone who'd like to start, I hope to would like to start this off. It does not have to be anything correct, just a basic understanding of what you think smart contracts are um, and how they um, come into place in the blockchain and Web3 space. No one. So I'm just going to start calling out names. Uh, okay, um, Wesby, um, okay, do you mind telling us what you think smart contracts are and uh, how what they actually uh, bring forward to the blockchain world? Um, now, okay, people might not have um, gone through them, so uh, I think I'll just uh, start. Um, yeah, so what smart contracts are, are just pieces of code that um, run on the blockchain, right? Um, so they're just simply programs um, which run when some certain conditions are met. Um, yeah, and so you could um, say the fact that, okay, we already have programs that um, if you simply have just if else statements, uh, that uh, smart con contract concept um, doesn't bring anything, anything new to us, right? Um, but that would not be the case because um, you've seen, you've seen where the blockchain is actually used to is actually used to really solve lots of issues like um, the double spending problem where um, one person uh, using some consensus algorithm is not really allowed to spend any money that he doesn't have, right? So if I only have $100, um, I can only send that $100 to one person, but I can't send, I can't send that $100 to Nathanael uh, and then go on to send another $100 back to Johannes because the only amount that I had was $100. And so I would have to then go on and get new money if I am to actually utilize the blockchain, right? I would have to get that um, blockchain's native cryptocurrency um, either in some way. So for, for Bitcoin, how it does it is um, there are these miners, there are these miners that are that are actually mining to solve that um, to solve that um, algorithmic problem. Uh, yeah, and when they solve that and when they add a new block to the blockchain, they actually get rewarded, right? So those miners have those currency. Uh, they sell, I can go on and buy that currency using fiat money if I have fiat money. Um, and yeah, and also there are, yeah, and there are different ways that different blockchains actually implement this uh, process of uh, new money entering the system, right? And so I would have to do that. Um, yeah, but on the concept on the concept of smart contract, they actually um, are really one of the most interesting aspects of uh, blockchain, right? Um, yeah, and that piece of logic that is um, that is going to run. Okay, yeah, so that piece of logic that is actually going to run uh, does not need any human intervention, right? And that code is actually visible to everyone else um, because, yeah, the blockchain is all about transparency. Um, and so if you are going to make any any transaction, um, when I say transactions from now on, don't just think of it as the monetary transaction of money going from one person to another, but 
transaction is just um, is just some sort of agreement and some sort of exchange. It does not it does not necessarily have to be uh, it does not necessarily have to be that monetary transfer, right? It, it is that action of uh, doing something on the blockchain. That action can be that monetary transfer. But it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that, right? Um, and so it is this way of actually seeing every code and having this uh, trust minimization between the action that you are you are actually you are actually going to be doing, right? Um, and so it might not really make sense at the moment. So let's take various examples of. Um, how smart contracts can actually uh, um, really help us, right? Um, yeah, so let's say um, in the web to world and in the normal sense, um, let's say um, you are a farmer, right? Um, and you're a farmer and you'd like to, you'd like to be, you'd like to pay an insurance company, um, some insurance company, some amount of money, um, let's say on a monthly basis, so you pay that insurance company on a monthly basis, basis, and um, if some if some hurricane arrives, or due to some reason, um, your crops are destroyed, right? So if your crops are destroyed, um, you need money to actually recover your losses to actually then go on to maybe um, farm on for the upcoming season um, and so on. And you're not really allowed then to go on and sell your um, crops or whatever product that you had um, because they're, they've been destroyed. But what, is, what most insurance companies actually do is um, they actually try to find loopholes as much as possible to actually not give you your money, right? Uh, of course, like how insurance companies make money is uh, lots of people actually put in money um, on a regular basis, um, and that money goes into the insurance company's bank account, and the insurance company hopes that um, something bad doesn't happen, right? And so you're really not guaranteed if that if that company actually finds that specific loophole. Um, yeah, you can think of it as a simple effects condition. Uh, yeah, if so, if that company finds some specific loophole, you're then not going to be getting your money, right? Uh, but what smart contracts actually do is, um, depending on the specific implementation of the smart, how the smart contract is written, I'm not saying that there might be bad actors that have uh, smart contracts insurances that actually might uh, not pay the farmer um, for that specific reason. But one, one logic that you can think of is, um, yeah, there, there are, um, yeah, look, I, I don't want to go into more advanced concepts, just having this, um, keeping this highly general overview, um, that smart contract would have the logic where if that specific condition happens, um, yeah, that farmer is actually going to get paid, right? So um, the contract is not going to go uh, out of its way to find specific loopholes. It's not going to go out of its way um, to not pay you, but that contract is a written contract. It's a written piece of code that is going to execute when a specific condition is met, right? So if that, if the signature that you found was if maybe let's say you live in an area where lots of hurricanes actually happen and um, your product your product has a high chance of um, being hit by the hurricane. Um, uh, that contract would automatically be pay you off, right? There will not be there will not be any um, yeah there will not be any delays. There will not be anything. There will not be any bureaucracy that you would uh, uh, normally go through, um, and you get your money right then and there. Uh, yeah, depending on your contract and uh, uh, the contract implementation, of course. Um, each smart contract that resides on its block on the blockchain um, has an owner. Um, in the example that we're taking, that owner would be uh, that owner would be the insurance company, right? And so, the insure what the insurance company could do is 
um, they would have a specific address, maybe um, either a dev team or someone in charge would have an address on that specific blockchain. So it would be that address would be the address representing the insurance company. Um, and so that insurance company, uh, that insurance company address can then deploy that smart contract, right? And that smart contract would then have its own address. It's a piece of code that is going to run on the blockchain, but that, uh, that smart contract can be, uh, can be owned by this insurance entity, by this other address, right? And so that address might have the ability to actually modify the code. Um, and so in some cases, this is actually positive because um, our contract, the contract might actually be buggy. Uh, and that contract might actually um, need to, to actually be updated as it goes on, right? Because at the end of the day, it's still a piece of code. Um, but yeah, that limitation of where um, that contract is actually going to give you what you want and the fact that that owner of the the owner of the contract or that has an address can't change that core logic um, should be the case and so you'd have all of this transparency you would be able to see all of the logic that goes in um, underneath into what you're negotiating right you don't have to read into like hundreds of legal arg legal arguments you don't have to hire lawyers you don't have to go through all of this also to actually um, do that and you just have to look to some sort of if else condition that is residing on the blockchain to actually meet your to actually meet your desired needs right um and so that is the basic concept of smart contracts and this basic concept goes throughout all of the blockchains right it goes to the blockchain of um algorand um they have their own they have their different specific implementation of the of how smart contracts work on algorand um there but it works this this core concept is the same either ways on ethereum uh, and on many of the blockchains that actually implement allow this uh, smart contract concept right right so bitcoin is a blockchain that currently in its current implementation um, is not yet visible it is not yet visible um it only allows for this monetary transfer of um, Bitcoin to uh, multiple parties. But yeah, this core concept is uh, is just the same, right? Um, okay, so let's, I, I believe, I, and I hope that is clear, but I would like um, for one or two people to actually um, phrase it now from the definition that I've given uh, so that because there are a couple of people who actually also joined in late. Um, and yeah, different people have different definitions of smart contracts. And so yeah, let me, I would like to have one person or um, two people to actually give their, give their rephrased versions of what I just said. So no one again what's happening mm -hmm. is no one there or is yeah nothing next. thank you go on hello hello hi can you hear me yeah we can hear you uh okay uh let me just try to explain what i have understand so far uh, so smart contracts are somehow uh, predetermined conditions. Uh, I mean, a pre a programs that run on some when co some conditions are met. So, for example, like let's say we can provide some information, and based on that information, we can uh, run some part of that contract. And uh, basically, uh, uh, as we all know, they are they are stored on the blockchain and uh, the, the basic definition is like uh, they run when some preconditions are met that's my understanding so far yeah and that's definitely uh, the correct understanding and yeah the uh, yeah the very adequate understanding of 
um, how do smart contracts work, right? And your smart contract can really be a complicated piece of code or it can be um, something that is really easy, right? Um, so let's go over through like the simplest um, algorand implementation of a smart contract that I can think of. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, some implementations that you can think of uh, actually implemented into the this week's project that we did, right? Um, let me share my VS code. So, yeah, I think it's cool. Okay, so let's start off by creating the new virtual environment. So um, what Algorand actually uses for um, its smart contract implementation is um, the T language, right? So it is this um, sort of assembly language that um, that is actually executed um, over on the Algorand blockchain, right? Um, and so there are various execution processes that actually um, happen for that execution. We'll say that is uh, a smart contract, contract is just a piece of code. Um, and that piece of code um, is then taken um, into, into the Algorand virtual machine, right? So the AVM, uh, the AVM is the machine that actually uh, executes that piece of code over on our Algorand or over on the Algorand blockchain. Um, yeah, so we can simply just create a contract or price script. Um, and so we've said that TL is um, an assembly level language. Um, and so um, they really provide, I think, let me go over to the docs and share a couple of links where you can look at T. Um, okay. So this, takes, this talks about um, the AVM um, the link that I've just shared talks a little bit about the AVM um, and how the T language works. Um, we're not going to be writing any huge code. We're going to be using PyTIL, which is um, a Python implementation or a Python wrapper um, over T, right? So our contracts can then go on and just be written in Python. Uh, and so you can also go on and uh, read about PyT here uh, over on the new link that I've sent. Um, yeah, and I'll be sharing the other resources after we finish, right? Um, yeah, so we've said we're going to be using PyT, which is the Python wrapper over the TIL specification, right? And so let's go on and from PyT uh, import everything. But I have not actually installed PyT, right? So let's go on to let's activate our environment. Um, and let's install PyT. So we have then installed PyT. Um, uh, so might be using another interpreter. Yeah. So the the one the one basic language that the the one there are like two methods that have to be implemented um, when you write smart contracts on Algorand. Um, but let's just discuss about the one which is the approval program, um, which is going to actually handle. Um, which is going to going to handle um, which is going to handle all of the core logic, all of the code or specification that we've um, talked about, right? Um, so how the method that you have to write is the approval program, um, and this is going to be a program. Uh, 
Um, the connection might be breaking up. Yeah, so what we're just going to have is going to be a program that um, returns an integer of one, right? Um, and so this specific method implementations, you can go on um, and look at them over the, uh, over the Python program. Uh, I don't know why this isn't, set, this isn't selecting the proper interpreter. Um, that we could have actually gone and seen how this works. Um, okay, I think let me reload this. So that this code has the proper configuration. Um, Now it has access to the, this actual um, virtual environment variables, right? So let's activate it again here. Um, yeah, so we've talked about, um, back on our um, DSA challenge, we've talked about the stack data structure, right? So which is um, this sort of stacking of, uh, the stacking of plates, um, like you can think of like, yeah, you can think of the stack data structure um, where plates are stacked on top of each other and it actually follows this um, LIFO, um, this LIFO um, mode of functioning where if you add um, a plate of sticks, to, a stack of plates together or a stack of books together, the last, the last item that is added on top is going to be the one copy, right? So it is, a, it is the stack-based um, programming language uh, which goes down into some memory access. But by the end of the day, um, that specific code or that specific if else condition is going to um, return a positive value if there is a positive one um, left on the stack, right? Um, yeah, and so that is just basically what this is doing, right? So if taking this out of the smart contract world, um, it can be like just having a simple program if we were manually handling it. Like this would work just as if like having a function, like having a simple function which would then just be returning true all the time, right? Um, this this program doesn't do anything, but it is simply just um, returning to this program never fails. This is a really good program, right? It, it is bug free. It's returning through all the time. And so this is what we, what this does as well. Um, it is putting in one on the memory or on the blockchain sense, we've seen, we've talked, we've said that transactions are not just those that monetary transfer, but transactions are those actions, right? So on that if else condition, this is um, always returning to, um, yeah. And we've said that, um, So we've said that PyTeal is a wrapper, and so at, by, at the end of the day, we're actually going to be compiling it down to the T version, right? Um, and so what we have here is uh, a program as the first argument that it takes. So um, it takes in a couple of arguments. So the PyTeal expression um, to assemble, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to assemble a program uh, and the mode of the program to actually assemble. So Algorand has this two specifications where um, you have a, where you have a smart contract or a smart application and you also have a smart signature, right? Um, and so there is this difference between the two and you'd have to specify what type it is. And what we're trying to do is actually make a program. And so 
our mode is 10 on application and you'd have to specify which version of P you'd want your uh, PyTeal to actually um, go down to. And I believe the default version is two, but we do now want that we want to use um, five in our case. Um, yeah, so we're not going to be using the sandbox and um, watching the Teal program actually execute, but let's just see what this um, approval program uh, is actually just going to be, right? And so it is going to return us the compiled Teal version, which is going to be adding that uh, one integer, this, um, this one on top of the stack. Uh, of the Algorand virtual machine, right? One factor of five, yeah. So this Pragma version five, it is the teal version that is going to be executing our smart contract. And it is going to be putting um, that integer one on our stack and just ending the program, right? Um, and what we've seen is um, there is this positive execution, just like this um, return of to where our function is um, executing and completely returning a positive value and completely working. What this is doing is just doing that, right? We have a simple function which just works. Um, and so this smart contract actually runs. And so any calls that are made over on this smart contract from any other address actually work, right? Um, yeah, and so this is the simplest smart contract that you can actually run and you can take this into your sandbox over or over onto your testnet um, and actually see it run. Um, but this really doesn't make sense, right? There is no logic to it. Um, simply returning to um, in our Python use case as well it does not make sense, right? And so let's see how you can add um, logic into your smart contracts. Um, yeah. And we only have a couple of minutes. So there is this one implementation I believe Lydia has shared. Uh, let me, if I want the resources challenge, but let me um, share it here as well. Uh, yeah, so what their implementation is simply doing is we've talked about this owner concept of smart contract, right? So where the address that is actually putting that smart contract, putting that code that is going to run on the blockchain over on the blockchain, right? So let's just simply use comments of one approach that you can follow, right? We have an owner address, which is the, which is the specific owner of the smart contract. Um, yeah, okay, which is the specific owner of the smart contract, right? And so this owner actually um, has some hexadecimal address um, which represents the owner. Um, in our case, this will be the Khan Academy address, um, which, which is going to be issuing the specific NFT certificates um, for the trainees that actually complete the program, right? And so you'd, you'd, have, you'd then save this, um, you'd save this owner address and you'd use it to deploy your smart contract. And so there are definitely um, any implementations that you can follow. The simplest one would then be to, to then go on and like, so based on their implementation, um, there is also this trainee address, right? So this trainee address that, um, that a trainee can actually um, use their private key to verify that that address is theirs and they're actually seeing that they've completed the program. And so what, what is simply just happening is you can use any other web to implementation or simply just a spreadsheet for this, but any address, um, any trainee address that has had a transaction, remember transactions don't have to be um, just those monetary transfers, right? Um, in our case, it is that uh, NFT transfer. So any address that has had, uh, that has had a that has a certificate transferred to them from that owner address uh, to that trainee address has actually completed the program, right? It is just this three steps. Um, so there is the owner address which is publicly known. Um, so Tan Academy would then go on to publicly state that that is the case. But yeah, 
Um, so this would be the easiest implementation um, that you can possibly think of. Um, yeah, and we have a guest talk and our guest has already joined. Um, yeah, and this is just the basic implementation of that. Um, and I believe Anastasia can 